All right, I think we should uh, try to get our seminar underway. Uh, thanks all for being here. Also, uh, obviously, welcome to uh, the visitors that we have here today, which it's always great to see that we continue to attract people uh, that are not part of our program. That's excellent. Um, we're very pleased today to have He Wang uh, speaking to us. He's one of the young faculty members at ISYE and part of the Supply Chain and Logistics Institute. And he's going to talk to us about the new frontier of data-driven price optimization. Thank you. Uh, so good morning, everyone. So um, my name is Hiwan. I'm a system professor at uh, um, ISYE. So for, for those of you who don't know me, so I just joined this year. And I'm very excited to present my research on uh, data-driven price optimization. And I also want to thank uh, Tim and uh, Andy for uh, inviting me and organizing the, the seminar. OK, so today I want to, I want to discuss data-driven uh, decisions uh, applied to price optimization. So we know that in general, uh, demand information is very important in supply chain, right? But demand, usually, it's hard to predict. Uh, so we typically model demand as uh, some stochastic processes. Uh, and uh, so the traditional approach to include demand forecast in the supply chain is what I call a sequential approach, right? So we assume there's first a forecast step where we collect historical data and we forecast and make uh, assume a demand model. And then we have a decision-making process. So we take the forecast as input, and uh, we optimize the model to make decisions. So in the, in the optimization part, uh, the optimization model simply assumes the forecast is known. Right? So today, I'm going to discuss another approach, uh, which I call a data-driven approach. Right? So in this part, the forecast and demand uh, decision-making uh, are closely uh, interacted. Right, so we assume the demand model is not known. Uh, instead, let's just make decisions and observe what happens. So we collect the data. Then we use data to uh, adjust demand models in real time. Right? So let me illustrate this idea uh, using this picture. Right? So we have three elements. So demand model, price decisions, sales data. So as a first step, we first uh, use our demand model, right? So to make some, to, we optimize the model and make some pricing decisions. So we offer the price to customers, and we observe the sales data, the actual transaction that happens, right? So in a, in a traditional sequential approach, right? So that's the end of the story. So we have these two steps, and uh, that's usually uh, what we do. But uh, today we're going to add another step. Um, so once we collect the sales data, right, so we can include this new piece of information into our demand model. So our original model may not be accurate, but with new, this new information, we keep refining our model. Right? So, so now we have a closed loop, and we can use the new model that we have uh, for, for the next period. Um, so we're, we're going to continuously have this cycle during our sales horizon. So in the extreme case, the cycle can actually happen after each customer transaction, right? So, um, so the technique uh, we're going to use in this data-driven approach is uh, online learning. So what is online learning? So uh, online learning is an area in machine learning that is specifically designed to consider uh, making decisions in a sequential order, right? So more precisely, this is also known as online machine learning. So we can compare it with offline learning or, or batch learning. So offline learning means we get all the historical data, and we just analyze it. But in online learning, we don't have all the data at the beginning. Right? So we make decisions, and we, we, uh, data become uh, available continuously. So we need to continuously include the new piece of information and use that to update our, our decision. So uh, why do we want to use online learning in uh, price optimization and, and supply chain? Well, there are two reasons. Uh, first, technology has made it possible uh, to use online learning. So with the uh, latest technology, such as uh, POS, um, and uh, for some online retailers, they can actually collect more detailed level of customer uh, browsing uh, data. 
And so we can collect data in real time. So technology has made it possible. Uh, the second reason is uh, companies are increasingly faced with a dynamic business environment, right? So think about the company launching a new product. So there's very few historical data uh, that is available to predict demand information. So at the beginning, the forecast model is very inaccurate. So we can use online learning to collect the sales data in real time and adjust our pricing decisions. On the other hand, if we use traditional approach, right, so if we just collect the sales data at the end of the selling season and then make a decisions, that may not uh, be useful because that's already the end of the product's life cycle. So the product may have short life cycles and there's really uh, a time pressure to make decisions quickly. So that's the reason we want to consider online learning. So uh, online learning has been uh, popular in the machine learning area over the past few years. Uh, here are some applications. One is uh, in pricing. Right? So in pricing, we want to learn customer demand. Uh, and our decision making is uh, uh, decisions are, are price that we offered. Um, another popular application is uh, online advertising. So in online advertising, companies want to display ads on their website, but they are not sure which ad has higher click-through rate. So they want to learn that in real time as customers uh, click the website. Uh, another application is recommendation. So the companies want to learn customers' preference and uh, to, in order to show the correct product to them. Okay? So today I'm going to focus on the first application uh, of, of using online learning for, for retail pricing. Um, so this is the agenda today. Um, so I'm going to discuss three different projects uh, that uh, I have been involved in. Uh, so the first project is uh, a real-time demand learning and price optimization project that I did with Groupon. Uh, second is uh, uh, a online learning uh, project uh, that uh, we did with Rulala, uh, a flash sale fashion, com uh, fashion company. And uh, the last one is an uh, ongoing project uh, with Oracle. So in each of the projects, um, I would like to show some high-level ideas and the principles of online learning, but I also want to show some details of math and uh, the techniques of. Uh, so in fact, what I want to emphasize is that in each of the applications, we face some challenges that are unique to the company's scenario. Okay. So let me start with uh, the Groupon project. And uh, this is joint work with uh, Wang Chi Chong. Uh, he's now uh, at the ASTAR Institute in Singapore, David Sim Shilevi at MIT, and the, and the Groupon Data Science team. So, um, so to begin with, um, just a show of hands, how many of you have used uh, Groupon before? OK, most of you. OK, so, so Groupon is now the largest e-commerce uh, website in the US. For, it's a marketplace for discount deals. So the way it works is if we go to Groupon's website, right, so we see deals such as restaurants, activities, et cetera. And let's say I like sushi, so I click the sushi, res um, this sushi restaurant deal. So on Groupon's website, it says I can, I can buy this deal for $21 uh, and redeem this deal at the restaurant for $40. So the Groupon's business model is that uh, after I purchase this deal and I pay $21, uh, the revenue is split between Groupon and the restaurant. So let's say the Groupon gets a third, so Groupon gets $7 from this purchase and the restaurant gets uh, $21. That's Groupon's business model. And our goal is to optimize this price, this $21 that uh, we showed to the customers. Um, so there are a few challenges uh, about pricing in Groupon. So first, Groupon is uh, a large company. It's operating in the US and also in Europe and Asia. So currently, Groupon uh, is available in more than 500 cities. Um, so every day, Groupon launches thousands of new deals. You can think of these uh, new products. Right? So every day, thousands of new products become available. So there's large volume of deals. So if you want to come up with a pricing policy, uh, want to come up with something that is automated. Okay? Uh, second, there's high demand uncertainty because many of the deals offered on the website are offered for the first time. So we don't have historical data uh, to predict demand. Right? And uh, last, 
uh, these deals face short product life. So data show that 70% uh, of the deals are sold within the first months of these deals are launched. So this shows there's really time pressure to use online learning. So if we use offline learning, we collect the data after first months, then uh, the sales already gone down. Okay. Um, so we started this project a few years ago. So um, there's a data scientist, uh, he's visiting MIT. And at that time, Groupon was only using fixed pricing strategy. Okay. So with fixed pricing, we know that after deals are launched, Groupon can easily collect the customer's purchase data on their website, but they're not using that to adjust their pricing strategy. So in the meantime, uh, I was working on my thesis on, on online learning and dynamic pricing. So immediately we realized there's opportunity. So our proposal is we want to use uh, online learning to learn demand on the fly after deals are launched, and then we want to adjust the price dynamically to improve revenue. Um, and one business constraint that Groupon uh, was faced is, uh, so Groupon's customers are price sensitive, right? So the deals are available only for a month. So if we're using dynamic pricing, but if we adjust price very frequently, then the customer may get confused. So you want to put a constraint on the number of price changes, right? So in general, if we want to do uh, online learning and price optimization, the key uh, challenge is to address the so-called exploration exploitation trade-off. So what is this trade-off? So on the one hand, we want to learn demand. In order to do that, we need to test different prices, right, to estimate customers' sensitivity to price changes. So this is learning, and the objective is to improve future revenue. On the other hand, the product is available only for a limited time. So uh, we also need to choose a price that is close to optimal so that we can maximize current revenue, right? So there's a tension between um, deviate from the optimal price to gain more information and to offer the, the uh, price that is close to optimal in order to, to maximize revenue. Um, so typically, in online learning, uh, a standard measurement of the performance of uh, the algorithm is uh, the regrets, okay? So what is regrets? So it's a difference between two parts. So first, this part is uh, we assume that there is a clairvoyant who can predict the future, who knows what the true demand is. And this is the clairvoyant's total revenue. So there are T time periods, so we're summing up all the revenue that the clairvoyant gets. So since clairvoyant knows the true model, uh, he would choose the optimal price P star for every time period. So this is the, our benchmark. The second part is our method, uh, the revenue of our method. So PT is the price that we choose for, for every period. Let's say we change price every day, right? So PT is the price for uh, day T. And this is the total revenue that we collect. So we want to compare it to, to this benchmark. And hopefully we can, we can make this uh, small, right? So we want to minimize regrets. And this is equivalent to maximize revenue for the company. But uh, in the online learning setting, uh, it's typically convenient to, to think of it in terms of regret. So in fact, we want to make regrets small. So we want to make uh, the average regrets goes to zero as time increase. So if we have enough time periods, right, we want to converge to the optimal price. Um, so unfortunately, for fixed price, we cannot do that. So for Groupon's current strategy, if they use fixed price, this is not converging to zero. So we want to come up with something where regret is growing slower than T or sublinear so that the average regret is going to zero. So we first consider the simple case where we can only change price once, okay? So for all, uh, one price change uh, policy, we come up with an algorithm so that the regret is no more than some constant times log t. So t is the number of days. Um, so here's the illustration of our algorithm, which is intuitive. So we split. This is think of this the entire life cycle of the products of t days. Say it's uh, 30 days or months. So we split this uh, one month into two parts. So in the first part, we just use the original price that the Groupon is currently using is uh, is the initial price. But uh, when we offer this price, we're continuously monitoring the sales, and uh, we're, we're collecting data. 
So at some point, our algorithm will suggest, let's change the price. Right? So for the second part, we offer a new price based on the data that we collected from the, from the first part. Um, so the trade-off here is if we make the first part long, we can, we can get more information. So this is exploration. But there's only limited time. Right? So at some point, we have to decide to stop learning and then uh, choose a new price. Uh, so we show that actually, if you set the t to roughly equal to log t, that's the best trade-off. Uh, so that explains why we get a log t regret here. So we also extend it to um, arbitrary number of price changes. So that was uh, the simple case where we only have one price change. But let's say the company say, I want to have five price changes. Okay, so how, do we, how should we do this? So again, we split the time horizon into, so if you can change price m times, we split the time horizon into m plus 1 different segments. So in the sec first segment, we, again, we collect data. So in the second, second segment, we use the information from the first segment and then choose a new price, and so on and so forth. So in total, there is uh, at most m price changes. Okay? So we show that with m price changes, the regret is reduced to m iterations of log t, so there are m log here, so we uh, use log m t to, to, to represent it. And we also showed this is the best possible rate you can get. Okay? Um, so this is a picture illustrate the theorem that we get. Right? So with no price change, with fixed price, the regret is uh, of order t. With one price change, it immediately reduced to log t. Two price changes, log log t, etc. So the immediate observation is that the first price change generates the most benefit. Okay? So since Groupon is faced with uh, a constraint of price changes, we decided that we want to implement uh, an algorithm with only one price change. So this is what we did. Um, so we test this algorithm at the Groupon. So we implemented the one price change algorithm. The initial price is negotiated between Groupon and merchant, so we don't have control over the initial price. But uh, once they, the, the deal is launched, our algorithm will monitor the sales, and uh, at some point our algorithm will decide a price change. Okay? So we added um, another constraint that the price can only go down uh, after the deal is launched. And uh, the Groupon says if the price decreases, it should be within this range. Okay? Um, and the merchant gets a fixture. So here's the example. Let's say, let's consider this uh, sushi restaurant deal. Let's say the initial price is 70, okay? And according to the agreement, Groupon gets $7, restaurant gets $10. So our algorithm will keep track of the sales, and let's say at some point, our algorithm will decide when to change price and how much to change. So if our algorithm decreases price to 15, then Groupon gets $5 and restaurant still gets $10. So why do we make this, uh, this constraint? Because we know that if prices decrease, demand is likely to go up. And if the restaurant still keeps $10, then a price decrease is always uh, good for the, for, the, for the restaurant. So the, basically, Groupon takes all the risks for, for price change. right? So hopefully, with price decrease, Groupon can offset the, the decrease in the profit that it collects by increasing in sales. Yeah. It's never allowed to increase the price. It's not allowed. So if the our algorithm suggests you should increase price, we simply ignore it. Right. So this is a constraint that uh, they want to they want to have. Right. Questions about this example? So kind of in line with what uh, Ben Wall was asking, do you come into capacity constraints with the restaurant that would lead you to increase price? Right, so in this case, we do not consider constraint because these are deals, right? So they are not physical products. So there's no hard inventory constraint. In practice, there is, um, they call it a cap of the deals that they can sell, um, but it's not a hard cap. So if the cap is reached, typically Groupon and restaurant, they can renegotiate, and then sometimes they increase the cap. So in this algorithm, we do not model the constraint, right? But one important uh, reason is that this is our just the deals. These are digital products. But for physical products, actually, we we have to consider. Actually, I'm going to show another example where we have uh, physical products. Okay. 
Yeah. So you mentioned maximum high price pings. With the expiration phase, you can show every customer, every unique customer, the price. That's something that you can uh, so we cannot do that. So the constraint is we want to show the same price to all customers, right? So if we can show different prices, of course, that will help us learn it. But then the customer may uh, become strategic and they can exploit this, right? <coughs> so technically, it's possible, but they're, they're not, um, they don't want to do this. So, so this is what we use in Serum, right? So we as, it, we, when sh we're analyzing the regrets, we, we assume that there is some fixed uh, demand function, right? And then uh, we, we will analyze our algorithms. So in, in practice, uh, we cannot compare this, right? So this is the regret. It's something that you can only analyze in Serum. So in Serum, we know our algorithm will converge to optimal, and, but we want to test it in practice. <coughs> Yeah, so very, very good question. So this is uh, what I show in the next slide, all right? So, so how do we, so as you mentioned, we have a constraint that we can only observe one price. So what we did is that before sales happens, we first come up with a few demand curves, so as our candidates. So think, of, think of this as different forecasts, right? So how do we generate these different forecasts? We collect uh, data about previous deals that have uh, similar features. So if it's a restaurant deals, we consider other restaurants in the same region of same, uh, same type. And we, so for those restaurants, we have already tested dynamic pricing. So we know the price sensitivity. And then we use k-means clustering, right, to generate k different uh, clusters. So these clusters are different demand hypotheses. So there are k different possibilities, right? So for each possibility, we know the price sensitivity. And we observe the initial price that we, that we uh, have, and then uh, check which one is more likely to be the correct demand model. Okay, so we did a live test at Groupon. So overall, so we tested this for a few weeks. We tested um, more than 1,000 deals that comes from five different categories, including uh, beauty and health, food and drink, leisure activities, et cetera. So for Groupon, the first two categories are, are most important. So they generate most of the revenue for Groupon. And um, so you can see these are also deals that has highest average bookings per day. So bookings means a customer books this deal. So for example, food and drink per deal average, on average has 88 bookings per day. Uh, other categories like shopping are less, uh, less popular. So this shows the number of deals that we test uh, in each category. And here's uh, the testing result. So we are comparing the uh, revenue increase uh, using, our, using our algorithms. So we, we have two different uh, metrics. One is bookings, which is the total amount of money that the customer paid to Groupon. And second is uh, what Groupon calls revenue. So this is the part of money that Groupon keeps after paying those local merchants. So both objectives are important to Groupon, right? So revenue is clearly tied to the profits of Groupon, and bookings is related to market share. So uh, for all five different categories, uh, we have a significant increase in bookings. And uh, for three of the five categories, also our revenue significantly uh, increase, especially for the two most important categories, beauty and uh, food and drink, okay? Um, However, for, for one of the categories, right, the leisure activities, uh, the revenue slightly decreased. So we suspect that uh, there are factors that we uh, are not included in the demand model. So for leisure activities, there's typically a very strong holiday uh, seasonality pattern. So during weekends or during holidays, there can be increasing sales. I think we're not included in that model, which explains uh, the decrease here. But, but overall, uh, our, the, the revenue for Groupon, uh, over all categories, is increased by about 20% using our algorithm. And again, the 20% is based on extrapolation of the revenue curve 
before you acted? Right. Or is it based on comparing to your early estimates that you have done? It's based on comparison of revenue of two parts, right? So we offer the initial price. And we extra tra extrapolate, so this would be the revenue that Groupon would collect if it keeps the fixed price strategy. Okay. And we know the revenue after price change. So we compare the revenue before and after. Okay. Other questions? OK. So, so that's the first uh, project for Groupon. So here, again, the, the constraint is the number of price changes. But uh, fortunately, we're, we don't have the inventory constraint because it's digital products. So next, I want to show you a project on, on physical products. Um, so this is joint work with Chris Ferreira, now at uh, Harvard Business School, and uh, David Simchilabi. Um, so in this project, we, we were collaborating with an online flash sale company. So, so these are a few industry leaders in, in, this, in this category. So these are online retailers. So they offer designer fashion brands at uh, deep discounts. And also these deals, they have limited time. So here, for example, is uh, it's a snapshot of the website. So they're offering this uh, watch. But if you look carefully, so the, here it says this deal is closing in, in two days. And they say it's down to seconds. Okay. Um, so, um, so we're collaborating with this company here, Rulala, which is, I think, the second largest uh, in, in, in this market, and it's based in Boston. Um, so for, for flash sale, they face a similar challenge that Groupon face. Right? So if they offer a deal, then this inaccurate demand forecast because this deal has not been offered before. On the other hand, because these are physical products, actually fashion products, so the inventory is very limited. So they typically just have a, f a few units of this inventory. And also, these uh, uh, fashion retailers, they typically implement decrease a uh, discrete price. So for Groupon, there's really no constraint on what price offer. But for these retailers, they have a fixed list of prices, say 10.99, 19.99, uh, 29.99, et cetera. So there's a fixed number of prices that they, can, they want to choose from. So our approach is we model it. It's, it's a classical problem in online learning called the multi arm bandits problem. So what is this problem? So we assume there's a gambler who has a sack of coins, and there are multiple slot machines. Okay? So the reward from each slot machine is unknown. So with each, with each coin, with each token, the gambler can choose um, one of the slot machines to play. And because the reward is unknown, the, the gambler needs to test different slot ma machines to learn about their reward rate. Well, the goal is to maximize the total reward given fixed number of tokens. <coughs> so this is, a, this is a classical problem in, in machine learning and OAP. So how is this related to the pricing problem that we want to solve? Well, uh, instead of uh, slot machines, let's assume we have fixed number of prices. Right? So this is a discrete list of prices that uh, the retailer has, say from 24.90 to 39.90. And the demand under each price is unknown. So the reward for each, think of each price is, is a slot machine, and the reward for each slot machine is unknown. And then we have a finite list of customers coming. So for each customer, we can show them one price. Right? So we show each customer one, one price. And uh, so the retailer, in this case, is a gambler. So the retailer wants to choose one of the price. Uh, in order to learn about the demand while maximizing total revenue. Okay. However, this problem is more challenging than the original multi bandit problem because the retailer also has limited inventory. So while we are learning this price, the retailer is also consuming uh, the inventory. And if we use all the inventory while learning, then there's really no value about the new information that we gain. Right? So we want to generalize the multi bandit problem with inventory constraint. Right. Okay. He clicks five minutes later, yeah. you show him a price of 24. Yes. You check whether I bought, whether you bought. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And you keep going. Yeah. 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 So in this, uh, uh, in this case, so uh, we typically, so this is extreme case, so we can change price after every customer. Typically, say the company may change price uh, every hour. Okay. So every period is one hour. So after one hour, the price changes. 
So a few notations. So we assume there are k different prices from 1 to capital K. For each price, right, so we model them as uh, an, an arm. So for arm k, the reward, rk, is the price of, uh, of that arm times the mean demand dk. Okay. So these rks are unknown to the, to the retailer, and the retailer wants, wants to learn about this. And we use r star to, to represent uh, the price that has the highest reward. Right? So again, uh, we, we are defining regress. So we assume there's a clairvoyant, then clairvoyant will always choose this uh, uh, optimal index um, to gain the, the highest reward if there's no inventory constraints. Um, okay. So in this case, because of the inventory constraints, uh, we created an algorithm that's built upon a popular online learning algorithm called Thompson Sampling. So interestingly, so this algorithm is uh, proposed more than 100 years ago, in 90, 1933. And it's originally proposed for, um, uh, for, test, for, for uh, clinical trials, right? So clinical trials, say so you have multiple treatments, and you want to test the effect of these treatments. Um, so, and uh, over the last few years, this algorithm has been rediscovered. And it's now being uh, very popular and be implemented at uh, companies such as Google and Yahoo for online advertising. Okay. So we want to use this algorithm for price optimization. So this is a randomized algorithm. So it, uh, it uh, keeps track of some posterior distribution of theta. So theta, think of it as it is an unknown variable in the demand. So your demand is unknown. So you have some unknown parameters. So the algorithms randomly draw some parameters from the posterior distribution, and then use that parameter to maximize price. But after the price is offered, then the algorithms collect the sales data and update the parameter. So this three simple steps is repeated for every period. Okay. So I want to emphasize this, this is a randomized algorithm. So let me show you an example. So here, the retailer can offer two different prices for this sweater, a low price, $29.90, and a high price, $39.90. And the, the true demand under the low price is 0.6, right? So let's say for every ar arriving customer, if we show them the low price, the customer has 60% of the chance of purchase. For the higher price, the purchase probability is 30%. But these values are unknown to the retailer when the season begins. So the retailer assumes that the mean the parameter, in this case, theta, is uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. So the, the purchase probability initially can be anywhere between 0 and 1. So the customer arrives, and the retailer randomly sample from the posterior. And this posterior is a uniform. So the randomly, uh, we draw two numbers from the uniform independently. And under these randomly draw samples, uh, P2 has higher revenue because P2 theta 2 is higher than P1 theta 1. So then we select the high price and offer it to this uh, arriving customer. And let's say the customer does not buy the item. So we update our information under this, uh, this high price. So there, uh, in this case, the posterior is a beta distribution, which has two parameters. Right? So the first parameter counts the number of successes. The second parameter counts the number of failures. So in this case, it's a failure because the customer uh, didn't buy. So we add one to the second parameter, and the shape of the PDF becomes this triangle. And uh, in the second period, another customer arrives, so we draw two parameters, but now theta 2 comes from this updated uh, posterior. And uh, in this case, we offer P1, and the customer buys the item, so we update the posterior for P1. So we keep doing this for every arriving customer. And the amazing property of Thompson sampling is that if uh, customers keeps coming, then our estimation or our posterior belief okay, of two different prices will converge to the true mean. So for P1, this PDF will converge to 60%. For P2, this PDF will converge to 30%. So in this case, this is an online company. And um, so every customer, if they want to check the price, so on the home page, they show the products. But they don't show the price. So if the customer is interested, they click the product and goes to another page, which shows the price. And uh, the company knows this information. So if the customer buys, we kind of just buy. 
if the customer doesn't buy, after clicking this, we counted this not buy. Make sense? But do you recognize them if he comes back in an hour? Uh, yes, in this case, uh, for this company rule, uh, they require you register account uh, before you can go shopping. So we can, we can tie the data to each uh, account. So, by the way, so this is a general, so I'm just showing this example for each customer, but in general, you can think of this every time period. Right? So the, also the demand doesn't have to be one, one or zero. So the demand can be many units. One period is hour, we observe the demand this hour, and we update it, and then, so, so it, this is not uh, unique to, to, the, to, the, to this case. Okay. So this algorithm has been popular over the past years. First, um, it can incorporate dependence among different prices. So we, have, we know that under the high price, the demand is likely to be lower than the low price, so we can incorporate that information, and empirically, this algorithm has very good performance. Right? So we modify these algorithms to include the inventory constraints. And uh, we just take the three steps of the algorithm, we, and we add a linear programming optimization step in between. So the, the linear programming is specifically designed to include inventory constraints. So here, inf j is the inventory for product j. So we include this constraint in this optimization. But the result of these constraints is that the solution is now not deterministic. So our algorithm will not say to simply choose this price. Our algorithm will probably say with 60% of the chance, choose high price. With 40% uh, of the chance, choosing low price. Right? So now our algorithm becomes randomized. Yeah, so we want to maximize revenue, but we have the inventory constraints. Um, and uh, so there, there are two versions of our algorithms. One version is here where we simply keep track of how many inventory units we have at the beginning, and we keep it fixed. So this is total inventory units divided by the whole number of periods. So this is, on average, every period, our inventory consumption cannot exceed the average units that we have. So another version is to keep updating the inventory. So we call this updating inventory algorithm. So we at every period, we keep track of how many inventory units is left and how many time period uh, uh, are left, and we compute this ratio. Right? So we keep uh, changing this inventory availability information. So intuitively, this may also improve the algorithm. Okay. So we call these two algorithms Thompson sampling fixed and Thompson sampling update. So here, let me skip the theoretical results and go to the, the numerical performance test. Okay, so here we test our two algorithms, TS fix, TS update, and a few other algorithms that have been proposed in the literature. So these are two different settings. So in, in, let's focus on the picture here on the left. So in this setting, we assume that the inventory units is uh, 0.25 times T. So at the beginning, say we have 100 periods, then we have 25 units available. If we have thousands, uh, periods, we have uh, uh, 250 units available. And let's compare the, our algorithms to a clairvoyant who knows the true demand. So the 100% means if we know the true demand at the very beginning, that's the revenue that we can achieve. And these curves are the performance of different learning algorithms. So this red curve is the performance of Thompson sampling with updated in information. So you can see with just 100 time periods, think of this 100 customer arrivals, our algorithm achieves 95% of revenue compared to someone who actually knows the true demand at the beginning. So this is really uh, powerful. And uh, with just, uh, say, 300 uh, customers, it goes very fast to 99%. Um, Thompson sampling fix, so the other algorithm that we propose also performs well, but not as good as um, TS update. And you can see for other algorithms, their performance is around 80 to, to 90%. Okay. So this is another setting. So in this setting, we have more inventory available. So the inventory is 0.5 times T. So if we have 100 time units, then we have 50 units of inventory. So again, so our algorithms dominates other algorithms in the literature for most uh, scenarios. Right? So you can see. Um, other algorithm performs slightly better in this case, which is intuitive because if we have 
if we have more inventory, then we have more freedom to explore other prices. So they perform slightly better, but uh, the performance is still not as good as Thompson sampling. So this shows Thompson sampling is ext extremely powerful, especially when you have very few units inventory, which is the case for this online retailer. So you have few unit inventory, the gap of with other algorithm is, uh, is bigger. Yeah. So, so this is really, so there may be different reasons, but this is a controlled experiment. So the only thing that we change is price. So the customer may have other reasons, which we don't have control, right? So the, the only causal effect that we're measuring it is the causal effect of demand against price. So we either show a high price or a low price. And the customers are randomly drawn from the pool of customers. So we assume that the demand is IID. Right, for, for all customers. And we're just changing this price uh, as experimentation. Right. Other questions? Yeah, yeah so, um, so this is a case for single product. Actually, uh, in the paper, we also extend it to a multi-product case so, or, or, or the network case. So network case is a case for airlines, right? So think of airlines, they have a connecting flight um, with two different uh, 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 flights. And in that case, this uh, itinerary of, two connecting, uh, of a connecting flight, the total price may be different from the sum of two direct flights. Okay? So in this case, we say if we have three cities A, B, C, and D, uh, sorry, three cities A, B, and C, we can have uh, three price. Sorry. Yes, three cities, so we can have direct flights from A to B. We can have direct flights from B to C. And we have a connecting flight from A through B to C, right? And when, we pro uh, when the airlines price these, uh, these products, they have to consider three products at the same time and cannot treat them individually because the connecting flight is also using the capacity of the flight from A to B, right? So uh, our algorithm can also be extended to, to the, to the multi-product case. Um, so actually, after we, we wrote this paper, so uh, a friend of mine at MIT, so he was doing a summer intern at, uh, at, at a retail company. Yeah. Sorry. I have one question for you, right? So, Thompson sampling by itself doesn't seem to do very well in mm -hmm. this case. And it must be because it doesn't recognize that inventory is running out. Correct, correct. Right? So, is it the case that the other methods start in a way increasing the price because they recognize that uh, scar scarce inventory? Yes, yeah, so the other algorithms, in this case BZ and this PD, BWK, uh, they both consider inventory constraint. So Thompson sampling does not consider inventory constraint, so it does not even converge to 100%. So all other four algorithms converge to 100%. So in this case, I think the non-monotonistic behavior is, of, is because of following. So in this case, with inventory constraint, the optimal pricing strategy is actually a mixture of two prices. Right? So the, if, you, if you given the inventory constraint, the optimal price can be 25% of the time you offer high price, 75% uh, of the time you offer low price. Okay? So what the, this algorithm do is, at first, they just randomly, randomly, randomly test it. Okay? So actually, that's close to the optimal strategy, because optimal strategy is also random. So that may explain why, at the beginning, their performance is good. And then they're doing something here that is keep learning, but actually they get more information, but the, the performance now decrease. And over time, they realize actually our initial policy may be good. So the optimal policy is actually indeed randomized. So they again converge to optimal policy and then converge to 100%. So that's, that's, my, that's my guess of the, of the performance. Yeah, so I, I was saying, so, so after, after we propose this, uh, so, so my friend, uh, he's doing a summer internship at uh, a company that works for revenue management for airlines. And uh, they also implement this uh, for, 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 for airline revenue management. Okay. Okay. So uh, other questions about Thompson Simply? Okay. 
So um, in the last part, um, I want to discuss uh, a project. Uh, this is an ongoing project with uh, Oracle Retail. And this is joint to work with uh, Mila Nambia and uh, Dave C David uh, Simchilevi. So we're going to discuss dynamic pricing with model misspecification and the endogeneity effect. So our motivation to consider, so remember this is uh, the picture that we have. So our motivation in this case is that we want to include the feature information in our pricing decisions. Um, so these feature information can be external information such as information about the products, about the competitors, about the environment, etc. So we want to include these uh, uh, information into our demand model and then do this closed loop process. So in this case, we're collaborating with Oracle Retail. So Oracle Retail provides pricing softwares to retailers. And through Oracle, we are collaborating with a brick and mortar fashion retailer. Um, so we, we collected data about customer transaction and item feature data about three years of uh, this chain of uh, fashion retailer. And uh, the data includes um, about 113 stores from 52 <coughs> different districts. And the items are in the categories such as fashion, furniture, homeware. So this is um, what the data look like. So, so first we have the transaction data. Right? So for each transaction, we know the time, we know the store, we know which item they buy and the price uh, they bought it. And we also have uh, product feature information. So think of these as fashion products. So we have t-shirts, tops, jeans, right? And then we have uh, the subclasses that describe these products. We have the pattern of these clothes and also the materials. So in total, we have uh, about 51 different features in the data that describe these products. And so we want to uh, take advantage of these additional information about the products to improve our, our demand forecast. So we call these features. So uh, recently, uh, dynamic pricing features uh, with features uh, has received a lot of attention in the revenue management literature. So these are a few recent papers on this topic. But the one thing that we realized in this paper is that they typically assume that demand is a linear function of the feature. So think of a feature as a vector. So if we have 51 different features, we have vector of length 51. So these papers assume that demand is a function of price and feature has a component that depends linearly on the features. Right? So if you have a feature vector x, uh, there is a parameter theta. So the only thing that matters is the inner product of theta times x. But we know that in reality, the feature may capture very complex information about the product of, uh, um, uh, characteristics and maybe your, compo uh, maybe your uh, competitors. So the true model may not be linear. So this motivates the question, so what if we use a linear function but uh, the reality is not linear. Okay. So this is a uh, misspecification. Okay. So, so we um, I'll skip the details, but essentially we consider a model where the true uh, demand model is nonlinear. So here f of x is the effect of features on demand. And f can be any arbitrary nonlinear function. And uh, we use a linear model here. So we have this linear function of feature x. Um, so what's, what's the issue with assuming a wrong model? So we found that in this specific case, uh, assuming a wrong model will cause a fact known as price endogeneity. Okay? So price endogeneity, technically, technically it means there's a correlation between price and the error term. So this is a term in econometrics. Uh, so this can happen with, uh, with, uh, with a model misspecification. So the effect of this, so let me illustrate this using this picture. Okay? So the blue circle is uh, the family, say, of a richer model. And the smaller yellow circle is a model that we assume. So in our case, the yellow circle represents all linear models. And the blue circle may represent some nonlinear model. This orange dot is a true model. Right? So the true model is nonlinear. So it lies outside the yellow circle that we assume. And we assume this yellow model. So we start with this green dot. Uh, 
as we collect more sales data, hopefully we get closer and closer approximation. So eventually, we want to converge to this point that is closest to the true model within the family that we assume. So since we assume a linear model, so, right, we cannot hope to converge to this true model, but hopefully we can get uh, very close and achieve a revenue that is very close to the optimal revenue. However, this is not what usually happens. So what usually happens is with price endogeneity effect, as the company is collecting more and more data, the model does converge, but it doesn't converge to the best approximation. It converges to something else because of bias created by this price endogeneity. So in some extreme cases, we may even converge to something that is worse than your initial model. So as you collect the data, your performance actually becomes worse. And moreover, this is not identifiable from the historical data. So if the company simply look at the historical data, they see a perfect fit as it gets more and more data. So this, OK, my model converges to this one. And, uh, but in, in retrospect, because the company doesn't know what the true model is, there's no way to verify if it's actually doing better or doing worse. Um, so here's, here's an empirical test that uh, using the Oracle data set. Right? So we collect this uh, transaction data and item feature data. So we first do a demand estimation part from the historical data. So we want to correct for this endogeneity fact. And we use the model that we estimated as a ground truth. So we want to do some experiments, but in this case, we're not able to do field experiments. So what we did is that we collect the historical data, we estimate a model, and treat that model as a ground truth model. And we test the different uh, algorithms uh, using simulation. Okay, so we first aggregate the data by different districts and uh, uh, week. So one period is one week, so we change price weekly. Um, this is the demand model that we used. So we assume the true model may depend on X in a very, the features in a very complex manner. So we actually use a random forest model to capture the effect of different features. So here it illustrates the endogeneity effect. So, so this is the model that we use. So one thing that we can do is we want to have a linear approximation. So let's just run a linear regression and estimate the coefficient of uh, B here measures the dependence of demand on price. So we want to estimate this coefficient b. So if we simply run a linear regression, these are the price coefficient that we get from five different product categories. Okay. So one thing that you may notice is that the scale here is very small. And for some categories, it's even positive for, for the second category. So positive means if we increase price, the demand actually increase. Right? So this really doesn't make sense. Um, so this is because of the price endogeneity effect. That, we, uh, that I mentioned, so it creates some bias in the estimation. So we use some standard method in external metrics to correct for the endogeneity effect. So we actually use a Hausmann variable. Um, so after correct the, this effect, this is the correct uh, coefficient that we get. So you can see that uh, the scale now makes more sense, right? So they're, they're, they're all negative. And uh, so say 0.4 means if, if we increase price by $1, then the weekly sale for this unit will decrease by 0.4 on average. Okay. So this is the estimation part. So we first uh, get three years of data, and we use that to build a model. And then we want to do simulation. So we test different algorithms. Um, OK, so let me skip this. So this is the algorithm that we propose for, for Oracle. So we call it RPS algorithm or random price shock algorithms. So what this algorithm does is that we get a linear regression and we get a price recommendation. But instead of offer this price, which we call greedy price, we add a small perturbation to the price. So the small perturbation in this case is delta P. Right? So we add delta P to the greedy price PG. So because uh, these fashion retailers are using discrete price, so they have a uh, press letter. So with some random probability, we'll move up one, one level. With some pr random probability, we'll move down one level. So on average, the mean of uh, the price shock is zero. And uh, the probability of uh, a price shock is decreasing over time. Because over time, we have more confidence about the model. So uh, there's less need for, for price experimentation. Okay? And after that, we do a two-step linear regression to estimate the price coefficient. So, so two-step 
regression is a standard method in ectal metrics to include uh, the endogeneity effect. So we compare our algorithms with other algorithms that is uh, proposed in other papers, which does not consider the price endogeneity effect. So this is the true uh, parameters for B. So this is our algorithms, uh, the estimated parameters after a selling season. So you can see the estimation of mean, and max, and uh, minimum uh, are very close to the, to the true value. But uh, other algorithms, even, if, even when the season ends, even when these algorithms already collect lots of data, their estimation does not converge to the true value because of the bias. Uh, created by the endogeneity effect. Right? So this is a popular method called iterated least squares. So you simply do least squares every time period to update the parameters. And this is uh, the greedy algorithm. So this is similar to our algorithm, but without adding the random uh, experiment. So you can see for both algorithms, they, they overestimate the price, uh, price coefficient. And this is the effect on revenue. So we test this on Oracle's products. And so these products, their life cycle is about 35 weeks. Right? So our, we, all these three algorithms, that we collect data weekly to adjust price. So this line on top, uh, this purple line, is we call it best. This is the clairvoyance revenue. So someone who knows the true demand uh, at the beginning. So this is our benchmark. Um, our algorithm here is uh, RPS, this blue line. Uh, so you can see the blue line is very close to the best algorithm. Um, greedy and this one step least squares, it's the green and red line, they're all close to the, to the optimal one. And finally, these two lines, blue, uh, black, and yellow, these are the company's actual revenue, so they're, they're much worse than this. So one explanation is first, their algorithms may be simple. They are not including real-time data. So all other algorithms include real-time data. Um, but another factor is um, this factory company actually has a markdown constraint. So the price can only go down, usually, for these products over time. So the algorithm that we tested, um, they don't include this constraint. So this gap may be exaggerated. So if we want to actually consider the actual performance right, compared to their current strategy, we should also include the markdown constraint. And uh, so, so even though we cannot compare it to the actual, we can still compare it to this other algorithms that is proposed in the literature. So we compare random price shock algorithms with greedy and iterated least squares, and also the best possible model versus clairvoyant. So compared to greedy, our algorithm increased revenue by about 8%. Compared to iterated least square, which is a state-of-the-art algorithm um, right now, our algorithm increased revenue by, uh, by about 3%. And uh, compared to the best possible model, we're very close to it. So the best, we're within about 1% to the best possible that uh, we, can, we can achieve. OK, any questions? Yeah. Put it so what? So from month. Financially, if there's a price in these fashion products in these brick and mortar stores, once they are in the store, typically they have a label that price is not changed. So they can have promotions in store, right? So it's say I have fifty percent discount, twenty percent discount. So they they can they can change these labels. <coughs> so they're not retagging it. Like usually they have like a suggested retail price. Usually they retag it. Say, yeah. But uh, I mean. For, for, uh, so they change the tag okay. over time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this is this. So what uh, the what uh, Oracle does is Oracle sells softwares that suggest you need to change price. So the retailer may implement this or ignore this. So this we, we don't know. We we only have data from Oracle, right? But uh, uh, if the retailer follows Oracle's suggestion, then they will change price according to to the software. Do they provide like the hardware that prints all these the tags and the prices? Hardware, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. 
I'm not sure about that. Um, but uh, so this is another issue. So let me go back to the picture, right? So in theory, our algorithm performs much better than, than the actual algorithm. But the, the actual scenario includes lots of constraints. Say they want to print these tags, right? So they may not want to change price very often. And there's also the markdown constraint. So uh, for example, one retailer that we work with, the typical policy is, say, after several weeks, they just have a promotion of 30%, which is fixed. So it's always 30%. And then after a while, it's 60% off. Right? So these are some constraints that we could include in the, in the future. So our comparison with the actual is uh, more realistic. I worked a lot in those domains. And these, these constraints are just because you expect that the demand is, is going down. Sure. They, they want, or or they, they want to clear their products. Correct. They want to make room Correct. for the other Correct. ones. Correct. So basically, you could, you could get that into the modeling yeah. and be stuck yeah. with those very arbitrary uh, things because they've got, they've got old-fashioned models for doing markdown price. Correct, correct. So, so yeah, uh, good point. So actually, this is something I want to mention as well following your point. Um, so this is the price trend in the data. So, so you can see over time, the price are actually going down, right? Um, so we also include the seasonality factor in our feature. So we have 51 features that describe the products. But when we tested it, we have a lot more features because we also have seasonality, we have the holiday effect, and, uh, and, and so on. Other questions? OK. So that's, that's all the, the projects I want to discuss today. So um, to summarize, so all these uh, three different products, they're built uh, on the technique known as online learning, right? So uh, if uh, there's one thing that uh, I want you to remember, it's that the online learning is a useful tool for price optimization. So online learning means we want to collect data in real time and estimate demand on the fly. So it uh, can be applied to many different supply chain and revenue management problems, especially when you have large forecast error at the beginning. And uh, also, um, by showing three different projects, I want to emphasize that usually for different companies, you have different situations that create different uh, constraints. So when you implement online learning, we may need to choose different tools and or in some cases, adjust tools right, to include the specific constraints that the company face in, in that particular situation. Okay. So that's the end of my talk. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Second company that you mentioned, the flash sale, mm -hmm. that's completely online. It's completely online, okay. yeah. And then the third one, Oracle Retail, that's an actual software. Yeah, so they product. provide software to a brick and mortar retailer. And the average customer for the, for the retail is like small or large? Or? I'm, I'm not sure about. So these are typically, so this is a retail chain, right? So they have 113 stores, so oh. I assume this is a big chain. Uh, but we don't know the identity so of it, this retailer. So it basically helps them compete online. Like, so for example, if a customer comes in and says, oh, I could get this on Amazon for cheaper. Sure, yeah, so they, are, they face competitors online. They also face also other brick and mortar competitors, right? So the Oracle just provides software that suggests price. Just not to understand the context. So my yeah. other question was, uh, with regards to the, the group on, uh, mm -hmm. Were you able to get like data from the marketing department to, to correlate back into who's actually purchasing or who's actually the customer? Good point. So we we have the data available. So this Groupon data science team, they actually collect data from all departments. Um, so there are many different channels from Groupon. There are customers come in by clicking emails that they send. There's customer who found this deal by searching on Google. There are also customers who just browsing Groupon's website regularly and buy these deals. Uh, so we have this information, but right now we're not including that in the algorithm. So we, in algorithm, we just treat all these customers generically. Right? So, but uh, if you want to refine the model, you can also potentially include these all different channels into, into considerations. So one thing that Groupon did, so after this project was done about uh, three years ago, so after this, product is, uh, this project is finished, Actually, Groupon has created a, a dynamic pricing team 
within their data science team, right? So they now have uh, several full-time employees, full-time data scientists that are uh, that are refining this uh, model that uh, we we built, um, and that hopefully by including different channels, they can also improve the performance. Okay. Yeah. What effect does uh, return items, either in the case of uh, root level or uh, right. Oracle, in the Oracle situation, um, does that skew your data? Like, are you weeding right. out the, the return items? Right. So. Um, for, let me give an example. For example, in, in an Oracle case, we do have returns that uh, is shown as the negative sales in, in the data, right? So, we, so uh, there are a few different ways to, to model it. Um, one is simply to ignore it. And second, you assume that uh, demand can actually be negative, right? So, so instead of assuming demand is always positive, with some probability it can go, go ne negative. But um, there's really... Um, I don't see a consistent way, what's the best way to model this? Because for return items, the price that when these items are bought can be different than the current price, right? So it's, it's hard to include, but when we use dynamic pricing, it's difficult to include the return item. So we're now just dealing with this in an ad hoc way, but I think it's a, it's a great research question right, to, to consider what's a better way to model returns under dynamic pricing. Price ingenuity uh, bias. How does it first like when you took it from econ economics? Like, what was the primary? How does it manifest itself in economics, and how does it manifest itself in a retail context of a, of a physical store? Mm. Like, how is it? Like, so it, maybe I can begin with example in retail. So I show this trend: the price is going down, right, for retail markdown price, because demand is also going down over time. So at the beginning of the season, there are customers who really want these products. So you can charge them a higher price, right? So if you simply look at the data, at the beginning of the season, you have high price and high demand. Near the end of the season, you have low price and low demand. If you simply do a regression, regression will tell you uh, demand will go up as you increase price, right? But that's not really the case. The, it's because of the seasonality factor. So this is the endogeneity effect. So this is also the original motivation in, in economics. Okay, if there are no further questions, um, thank you, and uh, I'm happy to discuss other things offline. <laughs>